This program is brought to you by the Nathan and Esther Peltz Holocaust Education Resource Center, also known as HERC, located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm Samantha Abramson, Executive Director at HERC. On behalf of our Board of Directors and our staff, we thank you so much for joining us for today's program. For more than two decades, through the lens of Holocaust education, HERC has been dedicated to building a more just society based on the values of dignity, tolerance, and respect for all human beings. HERC is responsible for programs that connect students and educators with Holocaust survivors and leading experts in the field to learn from their stories and their knowledge and to remember, educate, and inspire. At HERC, we are so proud that according to a recent study done by the Claims Conference, Wisconsin, true to our state's motto, Forward, leads the way in student awareness of the Holocaust. We're excited and humbled in the knowledge that our work is only just getting started. HERC is poised and ready to serve the needs of our state's students and educators through digital and in-person resources. Through HERC's world-class programming and educational resources for students, teachers, and communities, we open doors for challenging and critical conversations that need to happen. Conversations that help us not only wrestle with the questions of how the Holocaust happened and why the world failed to stop it, but also invite us to take steps as individuals and collectively to become upstanders in our communities. We need to send the message that acts of hate won't go unchecked on our watch. Our programming is made possible thanks to the generosity of our audiences. We encourage you to visit our website, holocaustcentermilwaukee.org slash support to make a gift. Your generous gift in support of our work will allow us to continue developing cutting edge programs like today's. Together, we can inspire future generations and make the world a more just society for all. Thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the program. Good evening, welcome, and thank you for joining us for tonight's program, The Rabbi of Buchenwald, The Life and Times of Herschel Schachter. My name is Carrie Altman, and I'm the Director of Outreach and Community Programming at the Nathan and Esther Peltz Holocaust Education Resource Center, otherwise known as HERC, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Thank you so much to our generous sponsors of this evening's program. Myra and Stephen Russick, Holly and Michael Russick, and Marilyn and Brad Shovers. And thank you so much to all of you watching for your continued support of HERC's important mission. It is a privilege to introduce tonight's special guest speakers. Mr. Saul Blau was born in Tarfa, Hungary in 1930. At age th 13, he and his family were removed from their home and sent to Auschwitz where his parents and younger sister were murdered. Mr. Blau was sent to work in a coal mine camp and months later, he was forced on a death march to Buchenwald concentration camp. After the war, Mr. Blau joined the Israeli Air Force and remained in Israel for seven years before traveling to the United States where he reunited with his surviving siblings and met his future wife, Viola Schlesinger. They have two sons, Robert and Andrew. Dr. Raphael Medoff is a professor of Jewish history and the founding director of the David S. Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies based in Washington, DC. He is the author of more than 20 books on American Jewish history, Zionism, and the Holocaust. Most recently, he wrote the book, the Rabbi of Buchenwald, The Life and Times of Herschel Schachter, published by Yeshiva University Press. Immediately following the presentation, there will be a virtual Q&A moderated by HERC's Executive Director, Samantha Abramson. Please post your questions in the Q&A anytime throughout the presentation. And now it is an honor to introduce Mr. Saul Blau and Dr. Raphael Medoff. Thank you very much, Carrie. Um, and I'd like to 
begin by also extending my thanks to Samantha Abramson, um, to Carrie Oldman, to Sarah Sillers and their colleagues for making this, um, for organizing this uh, program. And um, also thank you very much to our generous sponsors for help, helping to make it all possible. We're going to begin with a, a very short video. Um, it's an audio recording of Rabbi Herschel Schachter describing how he as a chaplain in the United States Army was part of the unit that liberated Buchenwald in April, 1945. So we're going to hear his actual voice recalling those moments when he entered the camp. And as, as you hear his voice, you're also going to see images. They're Polaroid snapshots that were taken apparently by Rabbi Schachter's assistant as he was walking around the camp on that day of liberation. I want to note that um, some of those images and the snapshots are very jarring, as you would expect. They're scenes from Buchenwald just moments after its liberation. So I, I want to alert you to that, um, although it is a very short video. It, it, the audio video in, in its entirety is only four minutes long because I think it's important to hear uh, Rabbi Schachter's actual voice, his actual recollection of those dramatic moments. And then um, at the conclusion of, of that four minute video, then we'll, um, we'll begin a conversation, myself and Saul Blau, um, and the program will continue. The most unforgettable day in my life was April 11, 1945. It was on that day that as a young American Army chaplain, I served with frontline troops across Europe and then precisely on that day came upon the infamous, notorious Buchenwald concentration camp. I had heard nothing of Buchenwald until that day. It was only my sad experience to have seen, to have participated in the ravages of war, to have seen city, cities laid waste and homes destroyed and human beings crushed. But especially do I consider it a privilege, tragic and grievous though it was, to have come face to face with the stark, bitter, sordid reality of Jewish tragedy. As I mentioned a moment ago, I came upon this hellhole called Buchenwald within a matter of hours after the first columns of American tanks rolled through and liberated that dungeon on the face of this earth. I do indeed consider it a privilege, tragic, sad, to have been among those who literally opened the gates of hell, the crematoria. I saw hundreds of human bodies strewn in front of the ovens that were still hot, the smoke still curling upward, waiting waiting to be shoveled into the furnaces. How can any human being ever forget such a sight? I stood there in front of those hot ovens, my eyes riveted to that view. I, I, I must tell you that whenever I even attempt to repeat this story, to relive that moment, it is exceedingly difficult to do so. I ran to seek out Jews to find Jews who were still alive, and indeed there they were in a long series of low barracks. I ran into one after another, and there again, no matter what we have seen or heard, believe me, there simply are no words in the human vocabulary that can even remotely attempt to describe the horrors the brutal, inhuman horrors that were perpetrated against our people. Within this huge Buchenwald camp, there was one area that was called Das Kleine Lager, the small camp that was reserved especially for the brutal treatment of Jews. I went into those barracks, and there I saw 
just raw planks of wood shelves on which were strewn st scraggly, stinking straw sacks. And there they were, looking down at me. Men, a few boys. There were no women in Buchenwald. But I will never forget those eyes, haunted with fear, half crazed, emaciated, more dead than alive. Spontaneously, intuitively, I felt the only language that I could speak that most of them would understand was Yiddish. And I called out, Sholem Aleichem Yidin, Yils and Frei, you are free, the war is over. And there they were looking out at me through incredulous eyes. But again, I can't continue. I could go on and on, but from that moment, I must tell you that my life changed. The impact of that experience was enormous on the whole course of my career. Saul, um, I'd like to turn to you now and ask you a little bit about your experiences. Mr. Saul Blau was uh, one of those whom I had the privilege of interviewing um, as I worked on the book, The Rabbi of Buchenwald. Um, and as, the, um, as, you, as you saw those images um, accompanying Rabbi Schachter's recollection of uh, the Day of Liberation, um, I wanna take you back, Saul, to those moments. Rabbi Schachter was describing what he saw as he came in through the front gate of the camp. But what do you remember? What was it like from your perspective? Where were you at that, at that moment? And what do you recall um, about the, the liberation itself? The liberation itself, I was in a much better position because I was placed in barrack eight, which was a special children's barrack under uh, uh, supported by the Danish Red Cross. And most of the things that you show that was in the Kleiner Lager, it was in the, in, the, in the small lager, and that was in concentrated. But I spent only a few days in that, and we were transferred to the, to the large camp to Barrack 8. But uh, I remember very vividly uh, that we were running for food, as soon as the, the camp the microphone sounded that, that uh, the camp is free and uh, we find very little food. And uh, like you, you mentioned that the bodies was piled up in uh, tremendous piles and all over the place. It was terrible, terrible condition, terrible condition there. And uh, of course, 21,000, People were rescued, were, were liberated in Buchenwald. Originally, the camp was holding more than 105,000 people. And the first ones to be taken on a, 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 a death march was the Jews a week before the liberation. They sounded uh, the microphones that the Jews should come forward. And they were anybody any jew that did not come for will not come forward is going to be shot on the place and our barrack commander the black al tester told us from no one you are not jews they gave us all kind of indent identities to sew on on our garments and uh, we remained that way till uh, the 11th of of, of uh, April 1945, exactly one week or eight days. Uh, every day they were transporting uh, out of Buchenwald seven, 8,000 people. And uh, the liberation came and it was, it was uh, I was not present in the small camp where Rabbi Schechter sounded off in Yiddish, Yidn is and Frey, Jews who are free, I was not present. But I was present later on when he came and uh, uh, to see him in the American uniform with the tablets on his lapel, it was something un unbelievable. And uh, of course, uh, he was present when the civilians from Weimar had to march to the camp. 
and to to you know they want to show them you know what their uh, the third reich uh, was doing and uh, the the corpses was piled up and then it was terrible terrible chaotic situation but slowly he took charge and especially was interested very much in the 900 kids who were liberated there and he directed uh, you know, his attention very much to that. And uh, I was there, I wasn't there, like I said, when I said that you, you, you know, Jews, you are free, but I was there on Pesach Sheni when he, he was handed out matzahs. Because that year, Passover was before the liberation. So he came and he organized a lot of very good things for us and helped us to, to get our uh, ways somehow uh, after the liberation. So many years later, I know you had the opportunity to meet Rabbi Schachter again at a reunion of Buchenwald survivors after not having seen him for, I guess, decades. What was that like for you to see him again? Well, I, I happened to be a New Yorker and I saw him quite often. Mm -hmm. We had some reunions that fizzled out later on because everybody started a family and, and you know, it was secondary to have those unions. But I saw him because I had my business in the Bronx and he had his school in the Bronx. And later on, he lived in Riverdale and I was very uh, often in Riverdale. And, and I had a, a home in the Catskills and he was invited there for a Shabbat to be, to be the... Um, for Shabbat, uh, what is it called? Uh, when you invite a rabbi for Shabbat, to be the scholar of, of scholar Shabbat. in residence. And I again, then I met him again on the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Buchenwald. I was there with my boys, with my family, and uh, I met them there. Uh, and so I had quite often uh, uh, contact with him. And he was a remarkable person. And I knew all about his activities, what he took up on later on, just with somebody at jury and all the activities that he was, he was involved with. You know, Rabbi Schachter, um, in his recollections many years later, he talked about how in the, in the first years after the war, in the late 1940s and in the 1950s and into the 1960s, he said very few people in the American Jewish community were interested in talking about the Holocaust and that he received very few invitations, for example, to speak about his experiences. Um, is that your recollection also that in those first years, people were not so interested in hearing what you, what you experienced, what you had to say? Well, I had that experience in Israel also. Hmm. Because, because uh, I was, you know, I was very young when I got to Israel also. And they saw my number on my arm. You know, I was in the Israeli army. And uh, people, till they captured Eichmann and they brought Eichmann to Israel, and then, then things opened up a little bit. And then, you know, the Jewish and the world was aware of it, what was, you know, the trial was going on for 100 days, if I remember. And uh, then when it opens up, opened up very much, and not fully. When it came to the 80s or the 90s, it loosened up a, a little bit. And, and when uh, people were get, you know, getting on in age and they started the Spielberg Foundation and it uh, and, and really opened up the, the schools. I've spoken in a lot of different schools and a lot of different organizations. So, and, and we were ourselves, you know, busy with ourselves, you know, trying to make a living, learn language. Yes. And uh, the public was not, uh, not that much interested. No, it's a different story. No, there were too many of us left to, to and, and remember exactly what was happening. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what it is so today, the reality. Well, thank you very much, Saul. We appreciate your sharing, your recollections, and your perspectives. Um, and now I'm going to uh, speak about um, the book and about some of the themes of, of Rabbi Schachter's life. Immediately after the war, 
when Rabbi Schachter returned to the United States after, I should say, after spending more than two months in Buchenwald, which is a kind of a, it's an extraordinary thing really to think about because um, while he was not the only chaplain in the US Army to enter a, a liberated camp, he was the only one to stay for a prolonged period of time. And what that meant was every day encountering, um, first of all, the spread of deadly diseases, which were, which, which were raging through the liberated camps. Um, and of course, um, all of the, the emotional and psychological burdens of, of ministering to, of counseling um, the survivors. We should keep in mind that Rabbi Schachter was of course, first and foremost, an American, uh, a member of the American military forces. His job was to assist American soldiers, not to, um, not to be involved with Holocaust survivors in a liberated camp, but fate um, decreed differently. So after those two months in Buchenwald, when um, the, um, the, the, the lines, the, the front lines of the Soviet and American armies in that area shifted and Buchenwald came under Soviet rule. So Rabbi Schachter's unit left the area and he came back to the United States. For a period of about six months, as I described in the book, the Rabbi Buchenwald, he went around the United States speaking about his um, about what he had seen, what he encountered in Buchenwald, um, about the plight of survivors who were still languishing in the liberated camps, um, and most of all, about the need for a Jewish state in Palestine. He spoke for the United Jewish Appeal and other Jewish organizations. And he emerged at that point as um, one of the preeminent voices of the Holocaust survivors. He was, um, he was an actual eyewitness. He had been there, he had seen he had, he had lived with them, um, and now he was communicating to the American Jewish community and the American public um, their, their situation. But as I say, after that initial period for many years, Rabbi Schachter was not in demand as a speaker, uh, and the subject of the Holocaust was not widely discussed in the American Jewish community. Um, but Rabbi Schachter's reputation as a... Um, as a spokesman for the community, uh, lingered on, and he and he he became known in the wider Jewish community because of those um, because of, of of that speaking tour and his reputation. Um, and as a result, it, increasingly in in the 1950s, major Jewish organizations looked to him as someone who could um, speak as as an authentic voice for. Um, for the Jewish people. This was, I should note, a very unique position for an Orthodox rabbi in the United States at that time. Um, the Orthodox portion of American Jewry was very small in those days. Um, and Orthodox rabbis were not prominent in the wider community or beyond the Jewish community, which is to say that Orthodox rabbis generally confined their activities to the Orthodox community. But here was Herschel Schachter kind of a unique figure um, because of his speaking abilities, because of his experiences in World War II as a chaplain in Buchenwald. He brought um, to the communal table a, um, a series of, um, of talents and experiences which put him in a somewhat different category. And so it was that um, already in the, in the 1950s, he was called upon um, by the Rabbinical Council of America to travel to Israel to try to negotiate a conflict to a, a, a uh, negotiate a, a resolution to a conflict there uh, between um, Orthodox and secular Jews in Jerusalem. I want to share with you some uh, images as we go along, and I'll begin with a photo from 1955. This is Herschel Schachter um, with the then Prime Minister of Israel, Moshe Sharet. There was the dispute to which I alluded was a conflict in Jerusalem um, over a, a, the opening of a secular youth club very close to an Orthodox neighborhood, which resulted in rioting. Um, and, um, and Herschel Schachter was brought in to, uh, and ultimately successfully, to, um, to negotiate a resolution to that conflict. Um, the significance of this, um, of this episode is that uh, Rabbi Schachter 
again, was increasingly seen as a, a, a Jewish leader, not just an Orthodox rabbi, not just a rabbi, uh, but as someone who could be involved on the wider stage. The following year, 1956, Rabbi Schachter was part of a delegation of Orthodox rabbis who traveled to the Soviet Union. Again, I want to emphasize, in 1956. This was just a few years after the death of Stalin. Um, it was after decades of the Soviet Jewish community being almost completely cut off from world Jewry. Um, but for a combination of reasons, which I explained in the book, Rabbi Schachter and a handful of his colleagues were, uh, were allowed to visit the Soviet Union um, and there to make contact with Soviet Jews to bring them um, encouragement, hope, communicate with them. This I'm showing you now is a scene from um, the Great Moscow Synagogue. That's Rabbi Schachter in the middle with the goatee and the hat. And he's speaking to a, there were um, huge crowds of, of Moscow Jews came uh, when they heard that these American rabbis were visiting. Um, and he did indeed bring them a certain measure of hope and strength um, after having had so little contact with the wider world. Um, but equally important, Rabbi Schachter and his colleagues in the Soviet Union during those weeks had an opportunity to confront leaders of the Soviet Union. This is a remarkable episode described, of course, in more detail in the book. But I want to show you a photo that was taken at the US Embassy in Moscow. It was a July 4th celebration. So the Soviet leaders came, came there as a matter of diplomatic protocol. And these arrows are pointing to the members of the rabbinic delegation. That A is, uh, you see Rabbi Schachter, see part of, of Rabbi Schachter's face there, and the D um, is pointing to Khrushchev, the Soviet leader. Schachter and his colleagues had a few moments to speak directly to Khrushchev and to, um, and to express their concern about the persecution of Soviet Jews. They specifically mentioned the fact that there was only one synagogue for the entire city of Moscow with its huge Jewish population. Khrushchev responded that um, there, were no synagogue, there were no synagogues because the Jews themselves didn't really want synagogues. It wasn't so much what Khrushchev said, really, that was significant, but the fact that an American rabbi um, had confronted him uh, and in doing so had made the Soviet leaders aware that there was an important uh, force in, in, in America, the American Jewish community, that was deeply concerned about the plight of their brethren in the Soviet Union. Following year, Rabbi Schachter was called upon, again, this time by the United States government, to accompany a large group of, of Jewish refugees from Hungary. They were fleeing Hungary after the failed revolution against the Soviet occupation. <clears throat> this is a scene from on board the ship. Rabbi Schachter was called upon to accompany um, and counsel the Jewish refugees. Because he spoke a perfect fluent Yiddish, he was able to communicate with these Hungarian Jews just as easily as he was able to communicate with the Jews in Russia. Um, less than a year earlier. Here he is in the kitchen, uh, which he made kosher for the uh, two-week uh, journey across the Atlantic with these Hungarian Jewish refugees. These experiences and a couple of others that I want to touch on briefly um, help illustrate why I chose to call the book The Rabbi of Buchenwald. The um, the process of choosing a title for a book is not always a simple one. And when you write a biography of a man who was involved in so many different, um, so many different causes, campaigns, organizations, it wasn't easy to come up with a title that would really, that could kind of cover it all. But after studying his life um, for years, going through his personal papers, interviewing people like Saul Blau, who had the occasion to meet him, um, it became clear to me that it was the Buchenwald experience that really transformed Herschel Schachter um, and, and ultimately um, colored the entire rest of his uh, career. So when I refer to, for example, him traveling to Israel in the role of kind of a, a, a statesman, um, traveling to, to Moscow to help Soviet Jews, accompanying Jewish refugees from Hungary and more, it's clear from his recollections 
that it was the Brooklyn Walled experience which drove him to commit himself um, day and night to helping Jews around the world. It was the, the memories of Brooklyn Walled which inspired him um, and, 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 and forged his deep devotion to um, trying to assure that Jews who were persecuted around the world would not be abandoned today as they were back then. Rabbi Schachter, as a result of his experiences um, in the 1950s, which I just outlined, um, began to rise in the um, ranks of the organized Jewish leadership in the United States. In the, uh, the mid-1960s, he became head of the religious Zionists of America. And then from there was chosen as chairman in 1968, chairman of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, the umbrella for all the largest uh, Jewish groups in the US. He was the first Orthodox rabbi to, um, to hold that position. Sometimes I've been asked when I speak about the book, was it prejudice against Orthodox Jews which, um, held, which, which held the conference back for so many years from finally choosing an Orthodox head? And, and, the, and my answer is, I don't think so. I never found any evidence of that um, in, the, in the documents, in the archives. But it's also clear to me that the general perception of, of Orthodox rabbis during the period we're discussing, the 50s and 60s, was that they were not suited for the wider stage, that they were fine ministering to their congregations, but that they really didn't have the level of sophistication necessary um, to, to play the role of a of spokesman for the wider Jewish community. Rabbi Herschel Schachter broke that mold. And so uh, by 1968, um, he rose to the pinnacle of Jew Jewish leadership. And what that did um, quite quickly is it brought him into contact with, um, with world leaders and made him a player um, on the national and international political stage. Here he is in 1968 um, with then presidential candidate Richard Nixon. Uh, Rabbi Schachter ultimately had many um, contacts with President Nixon, some of which turned out to be extremely important in terms of pleading the case for Soviet Jews and trying to convince the Nixon administration to make efforts um, on behalf of the Jews in Russia. The Soviet Jewry movement, Soviet Jewry protest movement in the United States is I think another a good illustration of, um, of how the Book and World experience shaped Rabbi Schachter's world. Here's a photograph from uh, a march through the streets of Manhattan in 1970. Um, we see Herschel Schachter is number four, five, six, seventh from the left. You see him with the hat, the mustache. Um, this is one of many uh, marches and protests in which he took part. Certainly his visit to the Soviet Union in 1956 weighed heavily on his mind, but just as much, I would say, the experience in Buchenwald too uh, committed him to the concept of what we today say call never again. Um, Rabbi Schachter, after completing his term as head of the Conference of Presidents of Jewish Organizations, then was head of the American Conference on Soviet Jewry. So he held another very important position, again, not just an Orthodox rabbinical role, but for the wider community. And in touching upon the Soviet Jewry experience now, I want to um, come back to a broader point about Rabbi Schachter, about his life and his legacy. Um, which I want to discuss briefly before we go to some Q&A. So I've been talking about the various uh, political and diplomatic uh, causes which Rabbi Schachter undertook in the, in the 50s and the 60s, all of which were sort of a natural reflection, I think, of his experience in Buchenwald. Now I want to talk about a less obvious way in which it seems to me the Book and World experience shaped his life. Less obvious, but no less important. Herschel Schachter grew up in what we might describe as a rather cloistered Jewish, um, had a, a kind of a cloistered Jewish experience. He grew up in Brooklyn in a very heavily Jewish neighborhood, Brownsville. He went to uh, strictly Orthodox yeshivas. And, um, and then he went from there on to yeshiva college and then rabbinical school, which is to say his entire upbringing, all of his social contacts, all of his religious experiences were very much situated in the 
um, in the Orthodox world, and to a certain extent, even in what we today would call the Haredi world, the world of, of more separatist Orthodox Judaism. He was not someone who had um, friendships or contacts or even professional relationships really outside the Orthodox world until, until circumstances changed his life so suddenly and drastically. As a US Army chaplain, Herschel Schachter found himself thrown into a completely different world. Already from his first days in chaplain, the chaplaincy training program, which was a several, program of several weeks conducted at the Harvard University campus, where he went in 1942 before beginning his military service, already there, he suddenly found himself meeting with, first of all, non-Orthodox rabbinical chaplains-to-be, reform and conservative rabbis, and also with um, non-Jewish clergy. This experience was starting to open up um, kind of a whole new world to Herschel Schachter. I want to show you a, a photograph from um, his days as an army chaplain. This is a Passover Seder, which Rabbi Schachter conducted for American GIs. And this is probably the Seder that took place um, well, let me let me fine tune that. We're not certain if this was this took place um, in 1944 or 45, but it's more likely it was in 45, and shortly before uh, the liberation of Buchenwald. As Saul Blau mentioned, Passover fell a few weeks before um, April 11th, when when Buchenwald was liberated. Rabbi Schachter found himself um, conducting Passover seder's for GIs under very unusual conditions, that is to say, in battlefield conditions. Now, you're going to notice, too, if you look closely at this picture, you notice what, I'm going to point out one or two interesting things. One, um, you notice the talus. He's wearing a talus around his neck, um, but it's not the usual large size Orthodox talus, which Orthodox rabbis, Orthodox Jews, then and now, normally wear during religious services, but rather it's a very small, it's kind of a mini talus. This is an army issue, army regulation talus, because like everything in the army, everything, um, all the soldiers' personal effects have to be small and compact and able to quickly put them away into, into a small um, traveling bag when, the, when his unit might have to move. Um, this was a, one of the things that Rabbi Schachter encountered and he simply had to accept that um, this was the new reality. He was going to have to wear a talis, which was very uncomfortable or unfamiliar to him. Secondly, the Passover seders, you can't quite tell because this one is indoors, but the Passover seders he conducted were all during the daytime. Now, as we all know, Passover seder is conducted at night. And according to Jewish law, you are not supposed to eat the Passover matzah until night, because that's when Passover actually begins. The problem for Rabbi Schachter in the army in Europe in 1945 um, was that if they were having a Passover Seder at nighttime with obviously lights on, it could give away their position to enemy, enemy soldiers who were not so far away. So the only way to have a Passover Seder was to have it during the daytime when it would not draw the attention of enemy, enemy gunners. So here you have Herschel Schachter, an Orthodox rabbi, conducting a Passover Seder completely at the wrong quote unquote time, wearing a, a garment, which is in his mind completely different from anything he would have worn um, because he had no choice. And my, my conclusion from my research is that the whole experience in the army um, helped open up Rabbi Schachter's um, views, his mind to, um, to the idea of, of, of having relationships with, you know, outside the Orthodox community, of being willing to be flexible and to compromise in various kinds of situations, to work with people who are different from him for the sake of a greater cause. I wanna share with you, as I wrap up my remarks here, a, um, a, a poster from an early Soviet Jewry protest march. This is from 1964. And it's a little hard to see in the, um, in the fine print, but this is a march, um, that was taking place in the Bronx, which Rabbi Schachter organized. Uh, his, his, the congregation, um, which he led for most of his life, was in the Bronx. It was called the Mashalu Jewish Center. And um, this rally in uh, 1966, 
if you can see in the small print under the supporting organizations, you see that the, the sponsors of this were, to begin with, the Central Conference of American Rabbis. That's the Union of Reform Rabbis. Um, you also have in this list the Rabbinical Assembly of America. That's conservative rabbis. You have the Union of American Hebrew Congregations. That's the organization of reform synagogues. You have the United Synagogue of America, conservative synagogues. And the, my point showing this to you is, again, Rabbi Schachter, although he, he was brought up in educated, in, educated in a world where he didn't deal with reform or conservative or non-affiliated Jews, but he had learned from his experiences in the army and beyond that um, there was a whole world of Jews out there and a whole, a whole community and a whole world uh, beyond the Jewish community, where he could have an impact, where he could make a difference, where his experiences um, could teach something, and, um, and where there were important battles to be fought. And so he was perfectly comfortable marching side by side and working closely with and forming friendships with reform rabbis, conservative rabbis, non-Jews, um, working with political figures um, in the wider realm, um, while at the same time, keeping one foot firmly planted um, in his old world. Here is a, a photograph um, from later years in which you see Herschel Schachter and the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And even from the looks on their faces, I think you can see um, they were very fond of each other. They were close friends. And, um, and, and Rabbi Schachter visited Lubavitcher Rebbe whenever he could. And they, they were not from the same background, Rabbi Herschel Schachter was a modern Orthodox rabbi. He was not a Hasidic Rebbe like the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Um, and yet Herschel Schachter had, had learned through um, his many uh, remarkable experiences how to maintain relationships um, both within his Orthodox community, um, in the wider Jewish community, and then in the wider uh, realm of American society. At this point, um, with, with time beginning to press upon us, I'd like to um, turn the microphone uh, back over to Samantha Abramson um, and open up the floor to any questions that any of you may have for uh, me or for Saul Blau. Thank you so much. So much. Uh, I just first want to want to thank Dr. Dr. Medoff for for that wonderful talk, uh, and I really want to thank Saul Blau, who, who's with us tonight as well. It's um, I, I think, think I speak for everyone that. It is such a privilege to be able to hear firsthand from someone who was, was at Buchenwald and can share uh, what you saw with us. So thank you, Saul. Um, so I, uh, you know, we are so blessed here in Milwaukee. Uh, I know we've talked a little bit about how, you know, in the beginning, right after the Holocaust, maybe communities in the United States didn't do a great job asking, asking questions about the Holocaust and uh, didn't talk about it openly. Uh, today in Milwaukee, we, we do a really wonderful job as a community exploring the Holocaust through a variety of lenses. And, you know, we just had our Jewish film festival here in Milwaukee uh, about a month and a half ago. And one of the films we'd had, we, we watched was called The Labyrinth of Peace. And it was about the, the boys of Buchenwald who were brought to Switzerland. And, uh, and Dr. Medoff, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about Rabbi Schachter's role in bringing some of those boys to Switzerland, because I, I understand that maybe he, he bent a few rules uh, to, to bring some of those, those people uh, to Switzerland. The story of the, of the children who went to Switzerland is one of the many remarkable episodes which I document in the book. And to, um, to summarize it briefly, after Rabbi Schachter had been in Buchenwald for a number of weeks, the governments of France and Switzerland each agreed that they would take in several hundred Jewish orphans. Um, in, in most cases, they were orphans. In a small number of cases, they were able to reunite with their um, parents who survived the Holocaust. But mostly, these were young people. Um, a train taking several hundred of the, of the Buchenwald uh, children went to France. And Rabbi Schachter was in charge of organizing the group that would go to Switzerland. The problem Rabbi Schachter initially encountered was that they didn't have enough um, children who had survived in Buchenwald 
to fill the number of places that the Swiss were willing to permit. Um, and uh, Saul has, has shared with us just a little bit about um, you know, the incredible um, conditions that, that he and other children endured there. So um, the way Rabbi Schachter was able to get enough, enough um, children to fill the train was that um, they were, a large number were brought in from um, other sites around, um, around Germany. Um, liberated slave labor camps and other places where there were um, where there were surviving children. However, the Swiss had very strict and imposed a very strict uh, age limit of um, 15. They didn't want any children who were older than 15. And many of the of the youngsters who Rabbi Schachter had assembled were over 15. Um, the to make things even more complicated, um, there were a number of children who, because they were emaciated and because of what they had suffered, looked older than they were. So the Swiss um, Red Cross nurse who was in charge of deciding who would be allowed on the train disqualified a number of these youngsters because to her, they looked like they were older than 15, even though they weren't. Um, Rabbi Schachter um, did something which was, yes, he bent the rules, but I would say went even further than and bending the rules, um, he really actually took a, a, a major risk with his entire, um, with his status as, a, as an American serviceman. Um, what he did is he uh, broke in to the office of the, um, of the doctor who was in charge of, uh, in, in, in the Buchenwald camp, who was in charge of, of examining the children and, and, and confirming that they were well enough to travel to Switzerland. He broke into that office late at night and stole a number of, card, of, of cards that were used to certify that the, that the child was fit to go. He then, um, he then enlisted um, several survivors to for, who, who were good at doing this sort of thing um, to forge the signature of that doctor on a number of these cards. And then he gave the cards to youngsters who either had been disqualified or he knew or he expected would be disqualified so they could go onto the train. Ultimately, he was able, we don't know exactly how many, but he was able to bring onto the train many more um, children than the Swiss were willing to allow. Um, because of time constraints and because I don't want to give away the entire story, let's just say that what I've described was not the end of the story, but there were um, some very dramatic moments um, as the train left Germany and then when it reached the border to Switzerland. So it was, it was an incredible story. Um, and had Rabbi Schachter been caught, had his, um, his actions been exposed, we may assume he would have been um, discharged dishonorably from, this, from the American uh, army with all that that implies. Thank you, it's quite a story. Um, so a follow-up question that, that has been asked by, by Michael and Holly, how much was the US army aware uh, of some of this, this work that, that that the rabbi was taking on, you know, not just related to to the, the children, but but you know, other elements of of life that he was bringing uh, through a Jewish lens. Well, to begin with, the entire existence of um, of a camp like Buchenwald was a complete surprise to the soldiers on the ground, not to the political leadership in Washington, and not to the army's senior officers. They were all fully aware um, of. The, of the Nazi mass murder process, of the um, existence of death camps, concentration camps, slave labor camps. It was all well known um, well before the war, but that information was not communicated to the troops on the ground. So they were not at all prepared for what they encountered when they went into Buchenwald. When we speak of the liberation of the camps by the allies, we're really speaking about an accidental liberation. Buchenwald was liberated not because um, those units were sent to liberate it, but rather because they stumbled upon it while in the course of pursuing their regular military objectives. Um, Rabbi Schachter, um, as a Jewish chaplain, was more aware of the existence of camps and about the, the, the mass killings because he, he followed the news, uh, news of, of what was happening to the Jews in Europe much more closely than his fellow servicemen. But still, and you can heard, heard in the from the shock in his voice at the beginning of the program, um, still it was an, an utter shock to see what um, what was there when they actually stepped inside those gates. 
Now, um, Rabbi Schachter had to request special permission to stay in the camp, to stay inside the camp. His unit was stationed in Weimar, a few miles away, um, and they remained in the area for a number of weeks, but they weren't, most of the soldiers were not in the camp itself. He asked his commanders for permission to remain in the camp, um, and he was granted permission. So uh, his commanders understood that that would greatly limit the amount of time he would have for his regular duties, um, assisting GIs with religious services, counseling, and so forth. And he did not completely neglect them during those weeks in Buchenwald. He did um, continue to help them in various ways. And some of the few photos we have of the religious services in liberated Buchenwald, you can see American Jewish soldiers um, in uniform in those services. So he was still part of the American army, uh, but most of his time was devoted to trying to help the survivors, just helping them on a very basic level, trying to, to regain um, their, their, you know, to, to, uh, to, re, re, to begin to rebuild their shattered lives, to help them try to locate um, surviving relatives um, and just to assist them with the most basic needs of, of nutrition and medical attention and translating and, and Rabbi Schachter even um, went into the business of smuggling mail, which is to say many survivors, of course, immediately wanted to write to their loved ones, um, um, but there was no mail service from Germany in the immediate aftermath of the war. Rabbi Schachter was not allowed to, um, to mail letters for them, but what he did is he took their letters and he put them inside larger envelopes that were in effect disguised as mail from um, him to his family, and that's how he got the letters back to New York and then could be distributed to their intended recipients. So he really was, um, in, in a number of ways, he was really bending and sometimes breaking rules for the sake of, of this higher cause. I'm just looking at the uh, some of the uh, comments we're getting in the chat box, and I'm, I'm realizing that we actually, we have a fair number of people uh, joining us tonight uh, whose, whose parents or family members were liberated uh, at Buchenwald and have, have memories uh, of, of, of Rabbi Schachter. So I just wanna, if everybody just has a minute, make sure you read those comments because it's, it's really amazing that in our community we have so many memories like this. Um, a follow-up question from, from Stephen and Myra is, can you share a little bit about the first service that Rabbi Schachter did at Buchenwald? Uh, you know, upon liberation? Do we know what kind of service that was? It appears to have been a Friday night service. Rabbi Schachter um, had a weekly routine of holding um, the evening services in the camp, on, on, talking about on Shabbat, Friday evening services in camp, in the camp, and then Shabbat morning services at the Weimar post for, the, for his fellow GIs. Um, we, there are a few photographs from those services, but very few. One is on the, um, on the picture of the, on the cover of the book. Now I wanna in fact show you this picture to which I'm referring just for a moment um, in order to share with you a, a point about this. We're not certain exactly when this photo was taken, but there are, there are, there are some recollections which indicate that it was on the holiday of Shavuos. If you look very closely um, on the far left of this photo, you can just make out some soldiers in uniforms. So, um, the, and the candles of course indicate that this was a nighttime service. You'll notice again, Rabbi Schachter here is wearing that small size talus that I mentioned earlier. But now I wanna draw your attention to another interesting aspect of this, um, of this scene. Rabbi Schachter is facing the congregation. This again is not the normal practice in an Orthodox synagogue where during the course of services, the rabbi is facing towards the, the Ark, the Aaron Kodesh. Everyone is facing towards the Aaron Kodesh. But there's a reason Rabbi Schachter had to depart from that practice and face the congregants. The congregants didn't have prayer books. They didn't have any sitters. Eventually, slowly, they were able to get hold of copies of the standard um, prayer books. But um, at this point, they didn't. You, you, when you look closely at the, at the, um, the people attending the service, I, I don't know if you see even one uh, prayer book. So some of the people were um, reciting some of the, of the davening of the prayers by memory, 
Um, but for many, they really had to, they, they were listening and kind of following along with Rabbi Schachter. So he wanted to face them so they could hear him more clearly because he was really serving um, as their spokesman. He had his small army issue, Siddur, prayer book, um, and he would uh, lead them and, um, and, and they would, in, in some cases, presumably repeat after him. Um, there were many such services and we have, um, we have recollections from survivors of some of them, but it, it, it proved very difficult to pinpoint which service took place when. And that's why we're not even 100% sure if that service was on Shavuos. But I do wanna say one thing about that photograph. Um, that is the single best known photo of uh, Rabbi Schachter in Buchenwald. And um, as a result, visitors to Yad Vashem, Jerusalem, may, uh, may have noticed that they have a very large blown up version of that photograph um, near the, the exit. And they started a project some years ago, um, Yad Vashem did, with that photograph because a number of people who visited the museum said they were able to identify themselves or their fathers or uncles in the photograph. So Yad Vashem began a kind of a, a list alongside the photo, gradually identifying a, a very significant number of the people in that photo. So it had, had the photo itself has kind of gained an interesting um, life of its own. And that's why I thought um, it was important to use that as the, as the cover of the book. Thank you. So my next two questions from the audience are related to the liberation. Uh, so first from Betty, did Rabbi Schachter liberate Buchenwald with President Eisenhower? Was, well, he wouldn't have been President Eisenhower yet. Uh, he would have been the general, but, but was Eisenhower there? And, and how much, if at all, did the two uh, interact with one another? Um, the short answer is that no, General Eisenhower, um, General Eisenhower visited um, camps somewhat later. Um, and, um, and there's, no, there's no record of Rabbi Schachter interacting with him. However, um, there was a delegation of journalists, of American journalists who came to Buchenwald at General Eisenhower's urging. And Rabbi Schachter acted as their guide and translator. He walked around the camp with senior editors of the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and many other important American daily newspapers. And he introduced them to survivors who who spoke about their experiences. Um, and ultimately those uh, newspapers carried some of the earliest and most important post-war descriptions of the liberated camps. And when, when the camp was liberated, um, were there any Nazis there or had everyone, had everyone fled by that point except, except the, the prisoners? By the time the Americans arrived, the Germans were, were gone. Um, there were some, in some of the other instances in which the Allies liberated um, camps, um, there were brief skirmishes with last, you know, pockets of, of German soldiers, but not in the case of Buchenwald. Um, in Buchenwald, there was some fighting before the Americans arrived because in the waning hours, as the Germans um, were taking the, many of the Jews on death marches that, that Saul referred to, um, some of the prisoners were able to get a hold of weapons and, um, and so there was some brief fighting between the remaining guards and some of the, um, some of the prisoners. But by the time the Americans reached the gates of the camp, the Germans were gone. So there, were, there was, the Americans entered without, um, without any, any, any violent resistance. Wow. All right. Uh, so this question is uh, about, uh, you know, what happens after you know, after the liberation, after the Holocaust, uh, you know, when, when the rabbis back in the United States, um, and as we talked about, there, there wasn't necessarily a receptive audience everywhere. Um, did people believe what he said? Uh, did they believe what he described he had seen at Buchenwald? Yes. The reason for the low level of public interest in the Holocaust in the years after the war um, was not related to the question of believability. Now I go into this issue in much more detail in the book, of course, um, but, uh, but to briefly summarize, in the first months after the war, when the American public was seeing newsreel footage in movie houses of the liberated camps and learning the full extent 
of the mass killing, there was a great deal of interest, uh, public interest, in what had happened. And indeed, that was partially responsible for the strong um, surge in public sympathy for creating a Jewish state in Palestine. When we speak of the low level of public interest, we're talking really about the 1950s and 1960s. Um, and there were a number of reasons for it. Um, part of it had to do with the general mood in America of wanting to get past the war, of wanting to just, to, for everyone to just get along and enjoy the new life and not be burdened by those awful memories. That was part of it. Part of it was the fact that West Germ now West Germany um, was America's ally in the Cold War. And there was great reluctance on the part of the American government um, to bring up uh, um, things, subjects that would, that would make the Germans look bad. Um, so that was a part of it as well. Sol mentioned that um, there was a, a, start, a, a change in attitudes with the um, trial of Adolf, Adolf, Adolf Eichmann. And that is certainly true. That was an important turning point. Um, but still, the real increase in public interest, American Jewish interest and the American public inter public's interest um, really began after the Six Day War. And that was a turning point um, in part because many people um, on the eve of the Six Day War thought that Israel was going to be destroyed and imagined what would in effect be a second Holocaust in their lifetime. Um, and it was in the aftermath of the Six Day War that then we find um, much greater public interest and also much greater scholarly interest. Um, the, the, the major books about the Holocaust really start to come out in the 1970s. So these, in, in brief, these were among the factors that shaped that phenomenon. But as I say, in, in, in the Rabbi Buchenwald, I discuss um, this whole, this whole uh, matter in much, in much greater detail. And a, a follow-up question to that uh, asked by Lewis, um, you know, was knowledge of, of the Holocaust and, and, and the camps and, and what was revealed when, when liberators entered those camps, do you think there was any effort uh, by the U.S. Uh, to suppress some of that, to maybe not, to, to prevent sympathy for refugees and, and others, you know, in that aftermath? We know from the documents that um, during the early years of the Holocaust, the Roosevelt administration made a concerted effort to withhold news about the mass killings. This has all been uh, amply documented in the famous book, The Abandonment of the Jews by Professor David Wyman. The short, the short explanation for why the US government would deliberately suppress the news was th the fear of many US officials that um, that news about the mass killings would result in public pressure to take steps such as opening America's doors to refugees, which was something that President Roosevelt and his administration strongly opposed. Um, gradually, however, uh, the information did, did get out despite the administration's efforts. It reached the mass uh, media, the news media, um, and it reached the media um, in time for something to have been done which is to say by the end of 1942 and early 1943, um, the fact that there was a deliberate systematic mass murder underway was well-documented in the American newspapers. Now, it's also true that certain major papers like the New York Times um, push that news to the back pages. The most important book about that subject is called Buried by the Times by Professor Laurel Leff. And there she describes how um, the owners of the Times and the editors deliberately buried this news in the back pages. And, and many other newspapers kind of following the lead of the Times then as now um, also played down the news, but it, it did, the news got out nonetheless. Um, and, um, and ultimately there were protests um, by, by uh, uh, many American Jews, which very late in the war actually impacted American government policy. Of course, that's a subject much too broad to go into more detail now. Uh, but as I say, Professor Wyman's book, The Abandonment of the Jews, really gives you the definitive story of that experience. Thank you. Uh, we are, we are uh, almost done with all the questions that have been asked already. So if anyone in the audience is, is holding on to that question, this is the time to submit them before we, before we say goodnight. Um, I did want to share this, this comment left by Esther in our question box. Uh, 
Rabbi Schachter was a guest of honor at the 50th anniversary of the Buchenwald Liberation Reunion in Israel. My dad, uh, David Schwarzberg, and his cousin, Joe Schwarzberg, were so overwhelmed with emotion in seeing and hugging Rabbi Schachter after 50 years. And just looking at, the, again, at our chat box, I, I am seeing that we have a lot of people here who, who have, whose families have some connection to, to Rabbi Schachter or, or the liberation of Buchenwald. Any more questions for our guests this evening? Does anyone want to share a, a family experience? Uh, since we do have some uh, on this call who, who can speak to this topic. All right. Samantha Marvin has raised his hand. Oh, thank you. All right. Can we unmute, unmute Marvin? Does that work? Yes, you have okay. the floor, sir. Great. Thanks so much. What a wonderful program. I just did want to comment uh, that there were groups of Jews who got out before 1939. My father was one of them, and, and some of them were drafted then into the U.S. Army. My father became a Ritchie boy and were involved in some of the uh, early work with the OSS on documenting the uh, liberations of different camps. But one of the things that uh, the professor mentioned was, you know, what was the role of, of people in information and how did that fit in? And I know that uh, PBS did a documentary uh, called Voices from the Heartland about Jews from Illinois, Michigan, Indiana, uh, Iowa, it, 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 right in the heartland, uh, Wisconsin, uh, that got together to help other Jews get out and provide uh, whatever it was that was necessary to overcome uh, things uh, such as the immigration quotas and, and uh, uh, the requirements to get in. And uh, that was a massive effort. It, it existed and people were there doing it. And I think, Samantha, I've sent you a copy mm -hmm. of that video that was done actually by our own Ellis Bromberg, who used to be from uh, Milwaukee Public TV. Thank you, Marvin. All right. And we have a few more questions. Okay. So we talked, I think we've talked a little bit about what, what uh, Rabbi Schachter did after the war. Um, did he uh, was he at the reunion in Washington, D.C. that seems to have occurred? Was that for the 50th? Or was yes, uh, yes, Rabbi Schachter was uh, one of the speakers there. In, in, you'll see in the book, there are a number of occasions over the years where, um, where there were reunions of Buchenwald survivors and where he had very um, emotional uh, meetings with people he had not seen literally since the Day of Liberation. So you can only imagine um, what that meant to both Rabbi Schachter and to the people he met. By the way, I see that, that some of the people, um, uh, some of the attendees were asking how to contact me. Um, I can be reached by email at rafaelmedoff uh, at aol.com, my name at AOL, or my website, wymaninstitute.org, W-Y-M-A-N institute.org. That's the website of the David Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies. Thank you, and we'll we'll make sure we include uh, that that contact information uh, in our post follow up program as long as that's okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, one question from Michael: Did the rabbi receive any? I know we talked about he sent some of Eisenhower sent some of his some of his staff to and generals to see the camps. But did, did the rabbi receive any support for his efforts at Buchenwald from, from higher command? Or was this something he took on, on his own? Well, Rabbi Schachter took on this task on his own, but there were um, important Jewish organizations, especially the Joint Distribution Committee that were providing um, all sorts of assistance, I mean, uh, goods um, to the survivors. Um, Rabbi Schachter never had any um, complaints about how his, um, his superior officers treated him um, 
you know, how they related to his activities, um, nor did he have any difficulties with Jewish organizations. We have to keep in mind that the situation um, immediately after um, liberation was chaotic. I mean, here you had American soldiers in circumstances that they never could have imagined. And, they, and, and, and we know from the correspondence of some of these soldiers that they could not believe such a place existed um, on the planet Earth, that people were capable of, of committing such horrors. They, you know, they, 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 they came into a camp where they saw you know, uh, piles of, of bodies and emaciated survivors and things that they never could have, could have imagined. So it was a wild, chaotic, horrific kind of situation. Um, and, um, and into this, um, into this horrific jungle, um, Rabbi Schachter stepped with a, with a, with a calming presence. And um, it, Saul mentioned that, um, that the survivors saw on Rabbi Schachter's lapel, the lapel of his uniform, the symbol of a Jewish chaplain, which was the two tablets of the, of the Ten Commandments. And this was a, a shocking thing for, um, for, for the survivors. They were accustomed to associating military uniforms with persecution, the Germans' uniform. Suddenly, here was an American soldier's uniform with a Jewish symbol on it, and worn by a man who was speaking Yiddish. So Rabbi Schachter really um, was, he played a very unique role, and he really was was, was someone who was in exactly the right place at the right time um, and able to do something that perhaps nobody else could have done. And he rose to the occasion to do it. Thank you. All right, I see that the rustics have their hand raised and then this is gonna be our last question slash comment for the night. Uh, do we have the rustics unmuted? I have asked. I have given them permission to talk, and they can unmute if they would if they would like to speak. Okay. There we go. There we go. Well, uh, I want to just say thank you to Dr. Madoff, and um, in particular, I I really want to take note of the fact that you so beautifully uh, shared with us this essential value of Rabbi Shachter, and that is Ahavat Yisrael, the love of the Jewish people. Uh, regardless of what stream they came from, what their circumstances were, uh, he, uh, he, he really embodied uh, the best of what we can be as a people when we try to work together. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you know, we do have one more question. I lied, I'm gonna allow one more. Marilyn and Brad ask, how long after liberation did the survivors uh, receive food, medicine, and clothing? Well, American soldiers immediately began sharing their army rations with the, um, with the survivors. And American um, military medical personnel immediately began uh, administering medical assistance. Now, it took time, of course, to bring in more adequate supplies, both medical and in terms of food. But, um, but there was food being brought regularly, every day, from the Weimar outpost, um, in addition to what the soldiers had in their, you know, in their, their packs and were, were giving out to survivors from almost from the moments of liberation. The story of the, of the generosity of American soldiers encountering these situations, I guess, is, is somewhat well known by now, but it's worth mentioning again. Um, because their immediate instinct was one of compassion. And um, even though they couldn't speak the same language as the survivors, they saw and understood immediately that even something as simple as a, as a chocolate bar or some other small piece of food meant the world to people who were, who were starving. All right, well, thank you everybody. Uh, I wanna thank our speakers again, and, and I wanna thank our sponsors who made tonight possible. And it sounds like uh, we're going to have a lot of follow-up questions and discussions. And, and please be on the lookout for a, for a post-program survey uh, that allows us to really create programs like this uh, even better going forward. Uh, so thank you so much for coming tonight. And, and I, I wish you a really good evening. Thank you, everybody. Take care. <laughs>
Thank you, everyone.